All right, thank you. So thanks for coming out this morning. Um, my name is Tom, uh, Tom Cross, and uh, I am a, uh, I'm a technologist. I'm actually the CTO of a local uh, software startup that does information security stuff. Uh, and um, I've also uh, spent a lot of time in my life uh, reading and, and working on civil liberties issues. Uh, and I've spoken at this Electronic Frontiers Forum many times over the years, uh, including some of the early ones in the late 1990s. Um, this is a talk uh, that has sort of been burning uh, inside of me for a couple of years, uh, and I'm really excited to have a forum uh, and a bunch of people to share it with. So uh, thank you for, for coming out. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna, it's a lot of content, and so I'm asking you guys to hold questions until the end. Um, if we don't end up having time to discuss questions in here, then we will go outside and I'll answer any questions you got. Um, but I wanna get through the content and I wanna make sure that I'm doing my time management right. So, uh, um, so uh, uh, um, just hold questions until the end. Um, so, this talk uh, really has an origin in a debate um, that was sparked by the disclosures that came out of Edward Snowden in 2013. Um, uh, you, you know, you really saw some polarized perspectives. I've got a lot of friends in the civil liberties community. I also have a lot of friends in the intelligence community. Um, and the perspectives that these two groups of people have about what was disclosed are really irreconcilable. Um, and uh, a lot of those people uh, sought to frame their perspective about of what was disclosed in terms of you know what the founders thought, which is a thing that Americans have a tendency to do. Uh, so here's one example. Um, uh, you know the, the civil libertarians arguing that the founding fathers would be you know rolling in their grave if they knew uh, you know what was going on uh, here over the past decade or so. Um, uh, Rand Paul is a good example of someone who uses that kind of, uh, of, of uh, rhetoric. And then um, you know on the other side of the the coin. Um, here's an essay in foreign policy. Uh, if George Washington were alive, he'd be reading your email. This is written by a guy named Stephen Knott, who's a professor at the Naval War College. Um, and um, I remember reading this essay in particular. And um, uh, uh, let me let me talk about a few things that it says. It says it's a distortion of history to assume that these tactics were encountered to the principles and practices of the nation's founders. The founding fathers were engaged in covert mail opening throughout this Revolutionary War. Certainly none of the founders spoke about a right to privacy. Um, uh, President Abraham Lincoln routinely intercepted private telegraph communications. None of this was seen as a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Um, and um, I'm being a bit charitable in my poll quotes here. Uh, he actually links the words right to privacy in this article to the court case Griswold versus Connecticut, uh, which if you know a thing or two about law uh, is an implication that the concept of privacy was invented whole cloth in the 1960s. Um, and I. I know enough about the history to know um, uh, uh, th that I disagreed with this. I know that, um, for example, Benjamin Franklin, uh, when he was the royal postmaster for the colonies um, before the American Revolution, required his um, uh, employees to uh, say an oath uh, that they would they would not open uh, anyone's mail without uh, uh, authorization, that they would prevent the mail from being read without authorization. So obviously the idea that, that mail should be private is something that the founders understood. At the time, I didn't know enough about the history um, to, to, to truly um, uh, refute this, this, uh, this point of view. And um, you, you know, there's gonna be a couple of digressions in this talk, and right now I'm gonna engage in a little bit of a digression. Um, every, and I emphasize the word every, political faction in our country engages in this uh, sort of rhetorical technique um, where you have people who take a look at a situation and they select a set of facts about that situation that add up to a particular conclusion and they write these essays where they say fact one, fact two, fact three, here's the conclusion. Um, and th these, these essays are very difficult to, um, uh, uh, to combat uh, for us civilians uh, um, because um, th th if you go research this, you look up fact one, it turns out it's true. And if you look up fact three, it turns out it's true. And if you look up fact five, it turns out it's true. And if you think about it, one plus three plus five equals nine. And so this essay seems to be a, a holistic piece of information that is irrefutable. Um, and it has a particular conclusion attached to it. Um, the, the, um, in, in order to be able to sort of immunize yourself against this kind of this kind of partisan ar argumentation, you actually have to know more about the underlying subject than the people who are writing these essays, and that's really difficult for people to do. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, there's a great demand uh, for the essay number nine and the essay number six. Um, people want uh, you to validate 
um, you know, the interests of their faction and tell them that their faction is awesome and they should get everything that they want and no one else's interests matter. And they, they love it when you do that, particularly if you're really good at it, if you're really well informed, they will pay you for it. You'll get a, a tenured university position, you'll get a job at a think tank, um, you'll, you'll get a radio show, or you'll, people will buy your books. There's a lot of money in it, and people tend to do what they get paid for. Nobody likes Mr. Purple 15. No one's interested in the idea that things are complicated and that compromises are going to have to be made. Nobody makes money writing essays like Mr. Purple 15. People get paid a lot of money to write either nine or six. Um, and unfortunately for us, um, uh, unless you have a full-time job researching these topics, it's hard to know more than these people do about them. And so it's difficult to know um, the additional facts that they're leaving out of their narrative and why those facts add up to a different conclusion. Um, and so uh, uh, with that, let's talk about uh, surveillance during the colonial era. So um, if we're gonna talk about surveillance, obviously we need to talk about the Fourth Amendment. Um, and the Fourth Amendment starts out in this building. Um, anyone know what this building is? Boston. It's in Boston. It is the old estate house in Boston. So when um, Massachusetts was a British colony, um, this was the main government building. Uh, it housed the legislature and the court, and it's still there. Um, in fact, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. So um, back in um, 1761, uh, a number of, pe of, of your founding fathers, including John Hancock, hired this guy named James Otis, who was sort of a firebrand attorney, uh, to um, protest um, this thing called the Writs of Assistance. So the Writs of Assistance allowed customs agents to obtain general warrants that allowed them to break into warehouses or people's homes uh, or, or anywhere that they thought they might find goods that had been smuggled into the country without taxes paid. Um, and so James Otis goes to this court uh, that was in this building, um, and he makes this argument, and it's this, it's this uh, sort of long-winded uh, um, uh, argument that he makes. He starts out by saying, a man's home is his castle, which is sort of a legal fiction that had been promoted by a few English intellectuals. Um, and he says, you know, you, you, you can't have, general warrants are not constitutional. You, you have to specifically describe the things that you're going to search when you get a warrant. Um, and he goes further, uh, and he points out that at the time, um, the line between professional law enforcement and individual citizens was a lot more blurry than it is right now. And so anybody could get a writ of, ass a writ of assistance. And he says, you know, what a scene does this open? And he talks about neighbors who hate each other, getting writs of assistance and vindictively raiding each other's houses. And then uh, he, talking about selling past clothes, he goes on to explain that, um, you know, Massachusetts doesn't have any representation in British Parliament. Uh, and so, um, you, you know, it's not right uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the British to tax Massachusetts if the American colonists do not have representation in the British Parliament. So this whole taxation without representation argument that you're familiar with from grade school, it is James Otis's argument, and it is first made in this courtroom in 1761 uh, when he's trying to get the court to overturn uh, the writs of assistance. So um, amongst the people assembled that day in the court is a young John Adams, uh, who is enthralled with this argument and says that, you know, everyone left the courtroom that day, like, you know, ready to take up arms against the British government. And he says, uh, this, he's writing years later when he says this, he says, then and there was the first scene of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there, the child of independence was born. Um, and so, uh, um, a couple things. So first of all, those of you who, who, who've been, uh, you, you know, who, who may have read some of the red uh, partisan essays that talk about um, uh, the problem with judges, uh, the activist judges and legislating from the bench, I want to point out that th this is the origin point of the American Revolution. And it is a bunch of, of your founding fathers in a courtroom asking a judge to invalidate a statute that had been on the books for a hundred years because they felt that it violated a constitutional right that no court had before recognized. Uh, and so um, that's something to keep in mind. And, and Otis um, uh, agitated about this for years afterward. Um, uh, there are a number of people who were his clients um, who ended up in confrontations with customs officials over the next 10 years, um, who seemed to operate with a very perfect understanding of the law and had been coached to sort of create confrontations with customs officials that would lead to an opportunity for Otis to go back into court and argue about this more. Um, Otis also wrote up 
um, his, his arguments, and they were disseminated by the Sons of Liberty, and so that's why everyone talks about no taxation without representation. This is where it comes from. So you can visit this building. Um, I went to Boston on a business trip a few years ago, and it, because I'm a privacy guy and an infosec guy, I was familiar with this case. I had read it, but I had no idea where it took place. And so I just, like, I'm in this building because it's a thing you see when you're a tourist in Boston, and I'm in the courtroom, and they have a plaque about it there. Um, they change their exhibits around, so it's not always there, but... Um, the, uh, um, but I'm reading the plaque and I'm like, wow, I am standing in the courtroom where this happened, where the concept of the Fourth Amendment and the idea of American independence were actually born. Um, so, uh, so by all means, go visit it. So, um, you know, while uh, uh, Otis was agitating for opportunities to get into court to argue about this some more, uh, there's another individual who was successful at that, and his name is John Wilkes. Not John Wilkes Booth, although it's quite likely that John Wilkes Booth was named for this guy. Uh, and don't let that um, color your judgment of him. Uh, so he, he was not an American, he was British, um, and he was a member of parliament. Uh, and he did not like the, the, the prime minister. Um, and in fact, he, his problem with the prime minister was that he felt that England had accepted too many concessions in the settlement at the end of the Seven Years' War, or what we call the French and Indian War. And so he published this, um, I'm gonna call it a zine, uh, uh, which he attacked the Prime Minister over and over and over and over and over and over again. The zine was called the North Britain because the Prime Minister was Scottish. Um, and, uh, the, the, um, and, and so eventually what happens is the Prime Minister sort of ghostwrites a speech for the King, which the King delivers, which is very complimentary of this settlement at the end of the Seven Years' War. Um, and so John Wilkes gets a hold of this thing and he writes, North Britain number 45, where he trashes this, this speech that the king gave. And as we know, uh, uh, King George III was not the best king, perhaps, that the UK ever had. So um, he uh, uh, um, you know, issues this general warrant for the arrest of John Wilkes and any of his co-conspirators and the seizure of any of their seditious paperwork. And so um, you know, officers go out and they, they haul some, I think, 49 people into jails. John Wilkes is put in the Tower of London. Um, and. Uh, um, John Wilkes uh, uh, sues, um, and, and he argues, you know, first of all, that general warrants are unconstitutional, that you have to specifically describe the things that you're, that you're seizing, the places that you're searching. Um, and, uh, you know, um, he, he's actually successful, but not necessarily for that reason. The linchpin of his court case is that he's a minister of parliament, and at the time, ministers of parliament were exempted from prosecution for seditious libel. Uh, so in any event, um, he actually gets a judgment against the people who like raided his house. Um, the Sons of Liberty back uh, here in the colonies are enthralled with this guy because he's standing up to the king and he's actually successful and they view his um, victory in court as a vindication of all their ideas. And so um, the, uh, they start having these parties um, and they, they, on the 45th day of the month, uh, which happens to be Valentine's Day, otherwise I would totally throw one of these, um, they would have 45 people stand up and give 45 toasts to 45 different civil liberties. Um, and Colonial Lim Williamsburg, they have this bowl, and I, I haven't been there in a long time, I don't know the actual providence of this bowl, but it's got the engraving of John Wilkes on it. Uh, it was probably a very expensive thing, and it may have been you know, something they might have used for, for those ceremonies. Um, uh, th there's a bunch of things named for John Wilkes. So here in Georgia, there's a Wilkes County. Um, also, uh, Charles Pratt is the judge who found in Wilkes' favor, and he also handed down a few other rulings that, that um, uh, supported the development of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, so, um, and he, he was the Earl of Camden. And so you may have heard of Camden, New Jersey, was named after him. In Baltimore, there's a Pratt Street and a Camden Street. Uh, the Baltimore Orioles play at Camden Yard. Um, and so um, uh, employees of the NSA, um, uh, when they go to a baseball game, probably go see the Baltimore Orioles play. And I wonder how many of them realize that they're watching baseball at a stadium that is named for one of the progenitors of the Fourth Amendment. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, this causes this idea that, you know, uh, warrant should be sp specific to spread throughout uh, sort of um, colonial culture. Um, and then um, George III does another very stupid thing called the Townsend Acts, uh, which were some, one of the last straws leading up to the revolution. Um, amongst the various stupid things that this Townsend Acts did, 
uh, was an expansion of the use of writs of assistance. And so um, it, it started out as just Massachusetts over here. They used them a lot in the UK. Um, but um, it, in every colony, uh, um, the customs officials were going to the court saying, I want a writ of, assi a writ of assistance. And the courts, um, now these judges had issued general warrants for other purposes for a long time, but they had started to hear that you know these general warrants might not be good. Um, and you know they didn't like the British customs guys anyway. So they would say, no, I'm not going to issue this warrant unless you describe what you're going to search. Um, and so th there's this dialogue that happens where the, uh, the, these, these customs officials are writing to the attorney general in the UK, and, and the, the attorney general is, is writing back saying uh, to the judge, you misinterpreted the statute. Uh, the judge is, is uh, um, in many cases, still wouldn't issue these warrants. Um, and so uh, uh, this causes Banky Townsend Act, the entire legal community in the colonies, to have this point of view that general warrants are bad. And so when uh, the colonies start to declare independence, they have this process of constitution writing. And it's a really important time uh, in which a lot of principles of civil liberty that people uh, may have recognized in, in, in English society but were not necessarily written down end up getting written down in an admittedly a haphazard fashion but still a very important one, sometimes for the first time. And so in Virginia, uh, the Declaration of Rights from 1776 says general warrants are bad and ought not to be granted. It doesn't say shall not, it says ought not. So you probably shouldn't do that, but it won't. Um, um, in, in 1780, John Adams writes this uh, provision for the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights, and it's a little bit more similar to what we're familiar with, that the right to be secure against uh, unreasonable searches, um, it defines, and it, it says, um, you know, again, like in, unless the warrant specifically describes what's getting searched, it ought not to be issued. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, in 1789, we're we're, uh, we're we're creating the, the Bill of Rights for the Constitution, and James Madison um, writes the Fourth Amendment. When he does it, um, he actually writes an amendment that's a little bit broader in scope and a little stronger than the one that John Adams wrote. Um, he says, not ought not, he says shall not be violated. So it's a very declarative um, uh, thing. And he also creates this probable cause standard. So it's not just that they have to describe what they're going to search. They have to explain why they think they're going to find something valuable there. They have to have a reason for that. And so um, uh, this is really, um, uh, uh, according to sort of constitutional historian Leonard Levy, who's in my references, um, this is he, he, this, he sort of put a, a, a flag in the ground in new territory here. He sort of said that this is, um, th this is a broader conception of this right than previously existed. And Leonard Levy argues that, that he changed the mind of a lot of people in Congress when he did this. And so um, I, I told you there were going to be a few digressions here. Um, I, I, a few years ago, came here and I talked about the search of electronic devices at U.S. border crossings. So right now, U.S. Customs says that if you're crossing the border, they can seize your laptop, your cell phone. They don't have to have any reason to suspect you of having done anything wrong. They can take them back and do a forensic analysis of them, and, um, you know, for whatever evidence of whatever. Uh, and uh, um, in addition, um, there's also this extended border search doctrine where uh, Customs says that 200 miles from the border, um, you know, they can perform searches. So this happened to a friend of mine this summer. Uh, she was visiting a national park in Texas. She's American. She did not cross the border. Um, uh, she was at the park. She left the park, uh, ended up in one of these random Customs checkpoints. Uh, they had a drug sniffing dog, which barked at her. Um, and so they took everything in her car apart, of course. Um, she had no drugs. There was nothing there for them to find. Um, and so uh, the, the basis uh, for, for these uh, policies is a Supreme Court decision from the 1970s. And in that decision, the Supreme Court says this. Um, you know, this Fourth Amendment thing, um, this was uh, created by the same uh, Congress that a few months earlier had passed this Customs Act. And the Customs Act allowed for random searches of ships, and it allowed um, customs officers to get um, a warrant to search a, a warehouse, and they didn't have to establish probable cause. Um, they, the judge was required to issue the warrant on the, on the good faith of the uh, customs officer. So the um, Supreme Court says, if, if this Congress thought that that was OK, and they passed the Fourth Amendment, they must not think those ideas are in conflict with each other. They must be consistent with each other. And therefore, our customs policies are also OK. Um, so I'm sorry I made an announcement in the beginning. I want to, everyone to hold questions until the end. Uh, it's okay. Um, uh, I know some folks have filtered in after I got started. But I got a lot of content to get through, so I got to manage time very carefully. So um, in any event, um, the uh, um, so in any event, um, uh, if you 
Uh, if you read historian Leonard Le Levy, he argues that that's not true, um, that, that this passage of the Fourth Amendment invalidated that previous custom statute. Um, and, and Congress never did anything like that again. And so if he's right, the whole uh, basis for um, th these kinds of uh, problematic searches may rest on an incorrect understanding of American history. Um, so, uh, slight digression, back to the topic. You may be wondering, I've been sitting in this talk for you know uh, 23 minutes or whatever, and um, no, there's been nothing about the mail. What the hell does any of this have to do with the mail? The answer is it has nothing at all to do with the mail. Um, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the Fourth Amendment was not intended to cover the mail. Um, th there are, um, th there are, uh, um, th th there's an interpretation that when the Fourth Amendment talks about papers, they were referring to the mail. That interpretation does not uh, occur until the late 1800s, and I'm going to talk about it. At the time, they weren't thinking that when they wrote this. Um, the the um, However, um, secrecy of the mail was uh, something that was recognized um, even much earlier than the American Revolution. So um, this is a royal proclamation from 1663, and it says, um, you know, no person except by the immediate warrant of the principal secretaries of state shall open any letter or packet not directed to themselves. So uh, postal employees are, 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 uh, are, are banned from, from reading the mail, but the secretary of state can issue a warrant to do so. Um, so um, I, this was echoed in another act in 1710, and as I mentioned, uh, Benjamin Franklin ran the Postal Service in the colonies. Uh, he required his employees to, to, to say an oath to this effect. Um, the, uh, however, um, in spite of that sort of um, footing, uh, the British, in fact, did a lot of mail opening. Um, there was a secret office in the British postal system. Um, it was and it created intelligence by opening and detaining mail and copying correspondence and sending copies to the Secretary of State. Um, there were warrants issued by the Secretary of State. Uh, some of them had hundreds of names, and sometimes these warrants not only called for the named individuals to be uh, spied upon, but also all of their associates. Um, uh, in, in 1765, they got bored with the listing of names, and so they just issued a general warrant for all diplomatic correspondence in London. Um, it, it, when this revolution thing got started in 1775, Lord Dartmouth, um, who's the American secretary, so he's the guy in the British government responsible for the Americas, um, he ordered the opening of all mail from America to England for the purpose of gauging public opinion. He wanted to see how widespread this revolution thing was. So all mail. Um, and uh, this is a quote from a, a historian, and it's in my references, who, uh, who uh, um, uh, you know, wrote about this. He said, secrecy made legality unimportant. So a lot of the records of the mail opening were destroyed. Um, and uh, um, it, it is not necessarily the case that everything was operating under a warrant eventually. They got real loose here. Um, so, uh, um, so this guy, William Goddard, um, was a newspaper man uh, who built his own independent postal network uh, in the colonies. Um, and he wrote this, this essay which he argued that you know, there was this parliamentary post that was run by the British government. And it's a threat to American liberty because they might intercept newspapers and delay news from being disseminated. So in the middle of a revolution, that would be bad because people would not know what was going on. Secondly, they might read the private correspondence of Americans and conclude um, that you know, uh, they, they could construe private correspondence into treasonable conspiracies, is what he writes. So they might um, you know, make a big deal out of nothing and hang a bunch of people. And so th this is bad. And so he proposes, he uses the word constitutional post. He proposes the creation of a constitutional post, uh, which is a a, um, you know, uh, an American postal system. And he actually stands one up with his own money in 1774. And in 1775, uh, the Continental Congress adopts it and starts funding it. And that is what becomes the US postal system. Um, and so what's really important about this is that the US postal system is, is born out of, um, in connection with the American Revolution, out of a concern that Americans have over the possible interception and reading of their mail by the government. Um, so. Uh, of course, the colonists were doing their own mail reading. Uh, um, the Continental Congress regularly received quantities of intercepted British and Tory mail. Um, uh, in 1775, they created this committee, which included uh, some prominent folks like John Adams and Benjamin Franklin, to go through a bunch of mail that they intercepted that was Tory mail and decide which parts they want to publish in newspapers for propaganda purposes. So they had no problem reading the mail, they just didn't want their mail read, right? You know? My civil liberties are important. Yours, uh, whatever. So, um, the uh, the uh, um, but what's interesting is that that 
you know, a few months later, they're already seeing abuses in this practice. They already have a problem with this getting out of control. And they create some rules around it saying that only these specially designated prominent people have the right to engage in this behavior. Right? It's not anybody who's working for the Continental Congress who's allowed to read mail. Um, so they, they, they tried it, they put their foot in the water, it hurt, and they, and they said, well, we better, we better regulate this a little bit. So um, in 1782 is the first postal ordinance that's passed by the Continental Congress. Um, it's kind of similar to the British ones. Uh, it says that you know um, uh, people who work for the Postal Service shall not open the mail or detain it or delay it. Um, but it does provide an official process uh, for access to the mail um, by an express warrant uh, from the President of the Congress uh, or in a time of war from the Commander in Chief of the Army. So um, at this point in time, the Army can read the mail whenever it wants as long as, the, as long as a senior official in the Army is given permission. So that's pretty... Um, it's much broader than we have today, um, um, but uh, that's, that doesn't stay that way. So this is really interesting. Um, there's a secret journal that the Continental Congress kept um, with um, provisions and resolutions that they didn't disseminate publicly. Um, and in this secret journal, uh, so there was this issue where after the American Revolution, so this is 1785, the American Revolution had been over for a year or two, um, John Jay, uh, I think he was Secretary of State at the time, I'm not sure, but he, he was concerned that um, the government of Canada was encouraging their citizens to settle in places that had been uh, conceded to the Americans in the war. Um, and so he saw the Canadian government as a threat. He felt that they needed to be spied on. Um, and he argued that, that some mail openings should be occurring and that this should be done in secret. And so uh, Congress passes this resolution allowing the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, to um, inspect letters in the post office. Um, what's interesting is that it's related to foreign affairs, that it's secret, um, and that it's considered a temporary measure. Um, and then a year later, they come back and they pass this again, and they don't put an expiration date. So we have a tendency to do that these days. We create these temporary measures and then we come back and they're permanent. Um, that was a problem even then. So, um, but the thing is that this is all before the Constitution is passed. When the Constitution was passed, it's not clear to me um, you know, whether these things are still in effect. Um, in 1792, they pass a new Postal Act, post-Constitution. This Postal Act says that if any person employed in the post office shall unlawfully uh, open mail, um, then uh, you know they would be fine. Um, now, what's interesting is that there is no more formal process for a warrant to be issued. They don't talk about warrants from the government. Um, they don't describe any formal process for the government to access the mail. Um, if you get real lawyerly in how you read this, you can note that it only applies to postal employees. So maybe other employees of the government are allowed to read the mail. And uh, it says the word unlawfully open, which may imply that there is a lawful way for them to open the mail, but they never specified it. Uh, so it's, it, maybe they meant to come back and fix that, but they, didn't, but they just don't. Um, so um, going forward, there, there was definitely a concern ongoing that mail was subject to being sur surveilled. This is Thomas Jefferson in 1798. He says, he says, the infidelities of the post office and the circumstances of the times are against my writing fully and freely. I know not which mortifies me most, that I should fear to write what I think or my country bear such a state of things. And so what I like about this quote is that he's saying that he's really uncomfortable with the fact that mail is surveilled. Um, we know that Thomas Jefferson was into cryptography. Um, this is um, what is supposedly a model of a Jeffersonian cipher desk. Um, and so it's a pretty intricate crypto system for the time. Uh, the, and, and it was, he put his own, he used, he was influenced by stuff that already exists, but he put his own spin on it. Um, and he influenced later uh, cryptographic systems that were used by the US military. Uh, this model, uh, which they sell in, uh, at US history sites, it's, it's a little disappointing to me as a, as a computer security guy, because it's not accurate. Um, you're supposed to be able to open it up and, and move the disks and the order of the disks. And if you can change the order of the disks, the cipher becomes much harder to crack. Uh, but in this model, you can't change the order of the disks, so you're kind of stuck in one room. Um, but it's still kind of interesting. Um, I, I couldn't find it this morning. Um, this is much more sophisticated than the ciphers that the Confederates were using during the Civil War, like 100 years later. Um, they had a single disk. Uh, it was kind of like a uh, um, decoder ring from their oval team. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's interesting that Jefferson went to such lengths. Um, but um, you know, over time, um, what's interesting is that in, you know, as the 1800s unfold, 
as, and I've done a lot of reading about this, it's not clear that there was a whole lot of mail surveillance going on, if any. So Stephen Knott argues that there was mail surveillance during the um, War of 1812, which you would expect, but the specific example he refers to is this thing called the Henry Letters. Um, and uh, you know, he says that the Henry Letters were, so James Madison spent $50,000 buying this thing called the Henry Letters. Henry was this British spy uh, that the British didn't pay. And so he sold all of his intelligence to the Americans. Um, and he sold it for $50,000, which was a, a ridiculous amount of money at the time. It was like enough to build a warship. Um, and so, uh, um, you, you know, the, the thing is that, um, and so the way that Knott describes uh, Henry letters is that he says that they were intercepted letters from Americans who were sympathetic to the British. And, um, and uh, uh, as I've done some digging on that, and I can't confirm that that's true. What, what I see in other sources is that the Henry letters were actually Henry's own correspondence to the Governor General of Canada. Um, and, and it was, and so you're, he's selling a copy of his own mail. And so that's not really mail surveillance. That's me selling a copy of my own writing to somebody else. So I, I don't think that counts. Um, I haven't found uh, much else. Um, in the, so the technology gets a little better. Uh, the Postal Service starts building these locked bags. And so um, when they're sending mail uh, over long distances, it's in a locked bag from point A to point B, and there are people in the middle who transport it, but they can't access the contents. Um, in 1825, they pass a new Postal Act. And this doesn't have the lawyerly stuff in the last one. It doesn't talk specifically about postal employees. It says any person. And um, uh, it doesn't talk about lawfully. It just says opens the mail without, uh, you, you know, with, the, with that's not theirs. And so, um, you know, if if this was sort of weasel wording around, sorry, if, if this was weasel wording around the issue, um, the weasel wording was gone in 1825. And again, there was no formal process for the government to access the mail. Uh, so David Seep is a law professor uh, who looks at the he studies the history of law. Um, one of his earliest uh, uh, writings was about. Um, uh, privacy, and he says, this idea that no legal process, no executive order could detain and open a letter in the post office captured the popular imagination. And he quotes Ralph Waldo Emerson, who said, to think that a bit of paper containing our most secret thoughts and protected only by a seal should travel safely from one end of the world to the other without anyone whose hands it had passed through having meddled with it. Uh, so really interesting, astonishing that maybe in the 1800s there just wasn't any mail surveillance happening. Um, so this is uh, in Congress, this is a congressman in 1876. He's talking about the Civil War. And he says, uh, when repeated applications were made by local postmaster of the importance of ascertaining hostile proceedings through letters deposited in the war districts of the country, an order issued from the department prohibiting sl the slightest detention, delay, or tampering in any manner with such letters. Now, is this an authoritative source? No. It's a congressman speaking like more than a decade after the fact, and we all know how to tell if a congressman is lying. You see if his mouth is moving, right? So I don't know. Uh, what I can tell you is that in a lot of reading about this topic, I haven't found any contradictory facts. Um, in fact, um, during uh, the Civil War, newspaper reporters um, would use the mail as a way of avoiding surveillance of the telegraph. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. So in, in 1878, uh, there's this court case um, over the mailing of, uh, of circulation of letters concerning lotteries. So they were doing lotteries through the mail. And the postal system didn't want to carry them. And they passed a law against it. Um, this guy went into court and he said, the Postal Service has a monopoly on the distribution of, of letters. And if it has a monopoly, then it cannot censor. It must be a common carrier. Um, they, they can't decide what to carry. And, and uh, the court sort of weasels out of this position by saying that the, 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 the Postal Service can decide what, the, what they want to carry and what not to carry, um, but, they're, but they're not a monopoly. You can set up your own postal system if you want, and you can carry your lottery letters, but you can't use our postal system. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of a let them eat cake proposition, because at the time setting up a postal system was a rather expensive endeavor. Um, but. Uh, uh, that was what they decided. And then they have a um, sort of, oh, by the way, that they include in this decision. Um, and the lawyers use the word dicta to refer to what a court says, oh, by the way. Um, they said, a distinction is to be made between what is intended to be kept free for inspection, such as sealed letters, and what is open to inspection, such as newspapers. 
The constitutional guarantee of the right of the people to be secure in their papers against unreasonable searches and seizures extends to their papers closed against inspection wherever they may be. So this is that argument that the papers in the Fourth Amendment refer to the mail. It's from, 17, it's from 1878. Now, um, again, I, I, as I said, this isn't an originalist perspective. If you don't like lawyers um, uh, legislating from the bench, maybe you might argue that this, that this is judicial activism. Uh, but that the, the fact is that um, for 100 years, the sanctity of the mail had been widely respected in American society. And so nobody blinked about this. Um, it was totally reasonable to constitutionalize this as part of the Fourth Amendment. Um, now, what, so, so we, we have this, uh, this constitutional principle, um, which is great, but we, we, don't, um, we, we, we don't necessarily understand it. Um, and, so, and so the next topic is the telegram. What about the telegraph? It's a new communications medium. It's extremely popular in the 1870s. Um, one aspect of the telegraph is that it involved creating copies of messages. We had human beings relaying them. So um, the message would come into me, I would write it down, and then I'd turn over and relay it out the next, the next route, um, the human routers. Uh, and every time they had these paper copies that they would store. And so that became something that could be subpoenaed. And boy, were they subpoenaed. Um, the Congress. Uh, subpoenaed three quarters of a ton of telegrams in 1876 in a real estate investigation, um, and uh, you know so so the Hayes Tilden election, which was in 1876, was highly contested. It was one of these sort of hanging chad kind of situations where no one was sure who really won the election, um, and the debate about it went on for for years. And so there there were um, uh, and so there were there were 30,000 telegrams that a Senate committee investigating that um, was able to subpoena, and they did these dragnet searches where they read every single telegram looking for any evidence that that something wrong had been done. Um, and so. Um, you, you know, tons of monitoring of the telegram system. Um, there was fights over this. Western Union resisted it. There was a Western Union employee in Missouri um, who was held in contempt of court for refusing to turn over a large number of telegrams with communications involving a named set of individuals. Um, and uh, um, you know, ultimately, they were forced to turn those over. Um, so, um, uh, in addition, you had um, you know, so so the 1870s, the Gilded Age, was really this sort of age of corruption. Um, you had a lot of political corruption. Uh, you had a lot of, of, uh, of, of um, you know, corruption in the corporate world. And Jay Gould is one of these Machiavellian characters who managed to slither to the top in an environment like that. Um, and so he takes over Western Union, and he does it. So he runs his own newspaper, and he, he has all this sort of um, uh, critical things that he's printing about them all the time to try to lower their stock price. And he, he uses some of his money to set up competing businesses, which they in turn buy, which causes him to get some of their capital. Um, and eventually, he manipulates the situation to the point where their stock price is low enough that he can buy it, and he just buys it out. Um, and at that point, he ensconces himself in uh, their corporate headquarters in New York City. Um, it's one of the biggest. Um, um, most beautiful, significant buildings in New York at the time. Uh, and it's also sort of a citadel because there's a bunch of people who are trying to kill him. Uh, and uh, he's very safe in his uh, fifth floor office up there. Um, the, uh, and and the, once he's up there, he has access to all of the telecommunications that are going on in New York City, all of the, the um, market trading uh, and the news related and, and secrets that are being shared about it. He can see it all. Uh, the Associated Press has an exclusive contract to use um, uh, Western Union uh, for their uh, uh, news dissemination. So he's in the middle of all the news. Um, and so he's sort of like this steampunk uh, corporate big brother. Um, um, and so, uh, you know, the telegraph is not a very private uh, communications medium at the time. Um, and, and the courts uh, don't recognize it as such. Uh, the courts refuse to extend ex parte Jackson to the telegraph. Um, and they make a bunch of arguments, but really the core of their argument is that. You know the, the postal system is this is has been respected as this private thing for the, a long period of time, and that's our tradition. But the telegraph is new, and and the tradition does not necessarily apply to it. It's not run by the government. It's not the same thing. Um, and so they they understand there's this tradition they're trying to uphold, but they don't really see it as a broad principle of the need to be able to communicate privately. Uh, they they really see it as being about the man. Um, Congress debated legislation protecting uh, telegraphs. They didn't pass one. So a lot of states did, um, but not in a way that made them legally privileged. Uh, um, Congress did resolve in 1880 that they would stop issuing dragnet subpoenas. So at least they decided that that was bad, but that's as far as they went. Um, the telegraph was not protected 
um, uh, by federal law until 1834. So um, in 1828, uh, there's, a, there's a Supreme Court case about wiretapping, and they conclude wiretapping doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment. Fourth Amendment, uh, they, they, they talk about eavesdropping, the Fourth Amendment doesn't mention eavesdropping. Uh, the, um, and so, as a, sort of as a consequence of a lot of different things, but the Olmstead decision being one of them, um, the, the, uh, uh, the, there's this Federal Communications Act in 1934. Um, and what it does is it says that it's illegal to intercept and divulge the contents of communications through, uh, received through wiretapping. So that language is interesting because it's intercept and divulge, which led some people to conclude that interception is fine as long as you don't do the divulging. And so there's, there's potentially a whole lot of wiretapping going on, but they can't use the results of the wiretapping in court. And they can't use it to develop evidence that they present in court. So it's stigmatized as an investigative technique, uh, but it is not necessarily prohibited. Um, uh, you, you know, particularly from an intelligence perspective, a lot of it may have been going on. Um, and and but, so this takes us to um, the 60s. Berger versus New York and Katz versus United States in 1967, um, where the Supreme Court says, no, 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 wiretapping does violate the Fourth Amendment. Um, and part of it is because um, we're getting to the point where we, well, let me, let me take a step back here. You know, we, obviously, at the time of the American Revolution, our telecommunication system is the mail. We're concerned about the privacy of the mail. We build our own postal system because of it. We, we imbue into this postal system this idea that, that the mail ought to be protected from surveillance, and we actually do a better job of that in practice than the British did. In 1845, the British secret offices publicly disclosed that there's a whole lot of controversy out there. Um, it, it's not clear that the Americans had something like that. If they did, they kept it well uh, under wraps from historians. Um, the, the, uh, you know, so we've got this idea that, that communications privacy is important, and a lot of our intellectuals, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, believe that, that, that that's, that's meaningful in terms of their ability to communicate freely and to think freely. Um, uh, but we have these new technologies that come about, and it's, so we, we eventually get to the point where we constitutionalize this principle. It's now part of the Fourth Amendment, but it, we haven't really appreciated its breadth. And then over time, we consider these new technologies, and we get to the point where um, we have another piece of legislation, the Federal Communications Act, that kind of says, you know, wiretapping is also bad. And over a long period of time, we say, you know what, this is the same principle. We shouldn't be listening to people's phone calls. We shouldn't be reading the mail. Um, privacy is an important part of the freedom to think. And so um, eventually, we get to the point where we now have this constitutional principle that communication should be private. Um, and it's something that evolved over time uh, throughout 200 years. And even before the American Revolution was a, con was a consequence of asking judges to recognize a right that had not been recognized before. So, um, you know, this takes me to a few conclusions. I've gotten through this material a lot faster than I thought I would. Um, <laughs> communications, <laughs> privacy, and the Fourth Amendment have independent histories um, that are intertwined with the American Revolution. Long-term customs can coalesce into constitutional norms as individual human rights are first recognized by people and then become better understood. Um, and so what the founders thought is a subset of what history teaches us. And um, it's a really important subset thereof, but it, the, the entire picture of what history teaches us is really what's important. And we're, when we're asking ourselves whether these practices that we're engaged in today are right or wrong. Um, so I, I have a few references. This is my primary reference. If you want to read about the subject, the number one thing, or, or you think I'm full of it, and you want to go check my sources, uh, read this paper by this guy, uh, and you just decide a law professor at Wisconsin law, law School. He wrote this paper called Wiretapping Before the Wires. A lot of my content comes from it. Um, it won an award in 2009 from the US Postal Service given to for scholarship in postal history. Uh, so it's been recognized as a significant source. Um, there's a whole bunch of other sources in here. Uh, including Leonard Levy's book on the origins of the Bill of Rights, which is a great book if you're interested in the Bill of Rights in general. Um, okay, so I blew through this topic way faster than I thought I would, um, and now I got lots of time for questions. Uh, I know that somebody had asked one. Um, All right, we've got a uh, yeah, we've got a remote microphone. It looks like it looks like a square nerf ball. Uh, it's the nice and soft. You can actually throw it across the room if you like. Um, uh, but I, I will run these. Please back. don't throw it at me. Yeah, no, don't throw it at me. Yeah, this is this is not a weapon. But I'll bring it back for the question. Okay. Um, I, uh, 
You mentioned uh, that during the 19th century, and certainly through the first half of the early Republic and antebellum period, uh, there was a broad consensus, if not necessarily uh, as much law, that the mail itself ought to be recognized in private and incrementally the Postal Service built up with sealed bags, etc. I, I don't recall exactly all the dates. It's an idiot in right. a notebook. Yep. Um, however, um, I, I'm a historian myself, okay. uh, and uh, uh, this isn't a gotcha, but could you speak a little bit about the Blair Encounter example that starts going in certain southern states in the 1840s and 50s when mail um, inexplicably suddenly becomes a lot less separate cyber saying when it comes from northern places and ends up in, say, Charleston. Uh, or Mobile, or Richmond. Oh, great. Uh, and it somehow just never quite makes it to its recipients. <laughs> so, well, okay, so um, I know a little bit about this. Um, there was a debate um, that, because I looked at this from a very legalistic perspective, um, so um, one of the debates that um, sort of preceded Ex parte Jackson, which is the decision that, um, that the mail, that the Fourth Amendment applies to the mail, was the situation in the 18, I think it was the 40s, uh, may have been the 50s, where where the where, where basically the southern states wanted the U.S. Postal Service to censor the distribution of abolitionist material in the South, um, and uh, um, there was a there was a there was a it, now when was Jack? Do you remember when Jackson was president? It was during Jackson's presidency, so maybe in the 1830s. Because anyway, it doesn't matter. It's in that period. 28. Time. Yeah, 28. It's the corrupt bargain. Yeah. In the 1830s. Okay. Yeah. So it was 1830. So so Jackson pr supports this this thing, but they can't decide whether or not it's legal. And so um, there's this argument that it would violate the the First Amendment for the the government to be censoring abolitionist material in the mail. Um, and then uh, this guy uh, comes up with this argument that 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 the government isn't censoring the mail. What they're doing is helping to enforce state laws. And so all we have to do is say the federal government is allowed to enforce state laws with respect to mail distribution, and we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but that argument is not successful. They don't end up passing a, a bill. Um, and so the Federal Postal Service did not um, engage in any of this behavior. But certainly, southern states did censor the mail. Um, and to be clear, um, prior to the Civil War, the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. So the states um, could do what they wanted to do. Um, uh, it, it, you know, except with respect to their own constitution. So um, this southern states had no problem censoring abolitionist material. And, and um, I, I'm not sure about the specifics of, of them interfering with the Postal Service or where the state authorities would have gotten to interact with the Postal Service. But I mean, I, I can tell you in colonial times, like, you, you know, they have like a tavern in the town, which is really just like a house with a living room, and there's a table, and then you know, some a, a kitchen area with some some you know some some flats, right? These things were small, um, and the the postal guy would come with the mail and he'd dump it on the table, right? And then you, if you had outgoing mail, you'd put it in a like box next to the door, and he'd take it, and then all these letters are just kind of sitting around in the on the table, and it was very easy to to you know you'd f have to thumb through them to find which ones were here. Right? So it's, it would not be surprising if in the 1830s, like it would be easy for locals to sort of intercept letters that were that were heading to that were that they didn't want disseminated because um, they were I think still being distributed that way largely. Does that does that help? Uh, it does, and you've already confirmed. Well, my follow-up was going to be: Do you know anything about how the southern authorities actually? I mean, I, I don't, but that's that's my conjecture that that like the way that mail was distributed was not actually very secure at the point of distribution. And I, uh, they talk a lot about gossip in these bars where people would be reading each other's mail at that point. Um, so, sure. Thanks. Can you go back one screen? Sure. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> so I I am not a historian, so my question will probably be less smart. Uh, it seems to me that the trend that you painted here is that privacy is sort of a belief that people latched onto and held, and then the legal system sort of caught up and eventually enshrined it as well. Yeah. Do you think that that trend extends forward to technologies of today? perhaps electronic mail, where I think a lot of people probably think that they're not being read. Well, many people in this room might understand that they are being read widely, but we'll, might be enshrined in privacy further in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, that what's important about this is understanding the process. And there's, it's an interplay between a couple of different things. First of all, it's like values, what people think is right or wrong. Um, secondly, like legislature, right? Like the, the fact that something might be illegal for a 
and then constitutionalization. So, um, you know, in the 80s, there's this thing called the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which says that, um, you know, the police have to get a warrant to read email. Um, and um, it is not until recently that some that there have been Supreme Court de, or there have been court decisions uh, constitutionalizing some of those concepts, like the idea that you have to get a warrant to read stored electronic communications. So um, that that process is still going on, um, but it um, it. With respect to this specific process that um, Professor Desai talks about, um, it, it, there's a long road uh, uh, to get to the point where something becomes constitutionalized as a principle. So it's not it's not a case where um, you cut, you have this fringe, I guess, group that has this particular perspective um, that something is unconstitutional or trying to convince the courts. It's more that um, the, the everyone buys into it. The legal system passes laws functioning that way, function that way over a long period of time, and eventually the court's like, look, this is how things should be. Kind of a, I'm kind of piggybacking on that one and um, and asking uh, about the uh, about the law of trying to catch up to the uh, to the technology of today. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, that really struck me during your um, during our digression about the uh, about, about customs officials searching your uh, your laptop and everything. Um, so, you know that you know is it just is it just the law not catching up to technology or? Yeah. So um, that's um, I that that's a topic that concerns me personally a lot, and I came here and talked about it. I think back in two thousand eight. Um, the the uh, um, so that's an interesting one. Um, uh, you know. So we it, it so first of all um, the idea that we have custom searches is something that evolved over time. Um, so I, I, we didn't necessarily have customs in the early part of this country's history. Um, certainly by, so I know that by um, uh, um, the Civil War, uh, there were, um, you know, if you were going into New York, uh, there was this uh, castle garden that you went to uh, when you're coming in, and there were searches happening there that were instituted for revenue purposes during the, during the war uh, that were sort of kept on afterward. And so this whole thing of like, Custom searching your bags when you come into the country is something that developed over time. By the time you get to the 1970s, it's pretty institutionalized that that's happening and there haven't been a lot of challenges to it. Um, and then um, in the 70s, you have the drug war going on and that creates all these, you know, bad cases make bad law kind of situations where, um, you know, they drilled into this person's gas tank and it was full of marijuana. Um, they didn't really know what they were doing. They just kind of randomly picked this person and drilled into their gas tank. Is it okay <laughs> for the government to drill into gas tanks without suspicion? Uh, and the court's like, it was full of marijuana. We want to send this person to prison. So yes, that's fine. Um, and, and so we get this, this uh, um, expansively, and one of the things that, that is frustrating right now is that if you are an innocent person and they don't charge you, you don't have standing to challenge um, um, the pro thing that went to that you went through, right? Like if um, it, it's only people who are guilty who end up being able to challenge uh, the constitutionality of the search they were subject to, because they are the only ones who um, have standing to to make those challenges. So um, the the and so you end up with these people that that the government wants to put in prison in court, arguing about Fourth Amendment rights, and and the, the all the other people who are innocent who were subject to these ridiculous searches. They, they, they're, they're not able to form a challenge because, they're, because there's no evidence to exclude from trial. Um, so I think, um, I, I, I believe that, that it's actually more complicated than, than in that specific case than, um, than uh, you know, the government failing to keep up with technology. Um, it's more, it's, it's a situation where they have this principle that people ought to be subject to search when they cross the border and they think it applies to everything. Um, and technology has made the consequences of that principle more significant than they used to be. Um, but, uh, um, uh, you know, the idea that, well, maybe that principle isn't such a good idea anymore hasn't sort of dawned on enough people. Um, and so I think that's really, if, I, hopefully that, that kind of helps, but it's, it's sort of a, it's a little bit of a different situation where we've evolved this principle over time and now technology is making the consequences of that principle much it's worse than it used to be. Yeah, it's not like we have this principle that we apply to some technology and we just need to apply it to that technology. It's a situation where we have a principle 
um, that, that we are applying to this technology that maybe we shouldn't. So it's actually almost the inverse case. Um, so you, 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 uh, I'm bored. so you struck me with um, something around expectation of privacy and privacy. So going back to colonial times, um, I'm getting a newspaper that's seditious in nature, but it's not wrapped, it's not enclosed. Yeah. So you know that's going through, and but I'm getting a, it in a sealed envelope. Yeah. Could you talk about that and then maybe bring it back to today with like encrypted emails, unencrypted emails, yeah. the expectation of privacy? <coughs> okay, so which, yeah, um, great. absolutely. So in Ex parte Jackson, which is in the late 1800s, um, they draw a distinction between newspapers being sent through the mail in the clear and things that are put in envelopes. And they argue that things that are sealed um, from inspection um, uh, you, you know, are not, are not necessarily um, uh, you, you, you know, um, subject to the um, same ability of the government to filter them. So, the fact that you put it in an envelope does affect your privacy rights. Um, the the uh, um, when we get to the '60s, when we get to uh, Katz versus United States, they use the words that you just used. They use the reasonable expectation of privacy, and so that case involves um, they weren't allowed to wiretap. What they did is they put a bug in a phone booth. <laughs> And um, the, they knew the guy was making calls from the phone booth. Um, and the, the argument that the court made is that the guy had a reasonable expectation that his voice would not be recorded in the phone booth. And that the Fourth Amendment doesn't just apply to your house, and they can't go in your house and put a wiretap there. It, 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 there's, it has this more uh, loose idea of, of what is your reasonable conceptions about this context. Uh, when I close the door to that phone booth, I reasonably conceive that my uh, that, that I'm private in here, and, uh, um, and and putting a bug in there violates that reasonable expectation of privacy. So um, the, it's a little um, uh, um, messy because it, it the, it's it's this thing where when the, it, it seems to relate to the word reasonableness in the Fourth Amendment, but the word reasonableness in the Fourth Amendment didn't originally mean uh, you, you know sort of objectively reasonable. It, it had to do with whether or not the, the it had to do with lawfulness. Um, it had, the, the the founders thought very differently about it than than um, the lawyers in the '60s did necessarily. Um, but uh, you, you know, it is a it is a concept that that gets applied today in, in Fourth Amendment law. It's like it's like, is it reasonable for you to consider this to be private? So I can take this to the, there's this uh, interesting case going on right now, uh, where the law enforcement took over this child porn site behind Tor, and from once they took it over, they were able to uh, use malware to infect the computers of the people that were using the site, um, and. Um, you know, um, they've charged subs subsequently, uh, you know, a lot of these people, and like I said, you don't get to go into the court and make Fourth Amendment arguments unless, generally speaking, you're actually guilty. And so um, there's all these fourth, interesting Fourth Amendment arguments, perhaps, that are coming out of this, and the, the, the you know, people who are making them are, you know, quite objectionable, and everyone agrees they should go to prison. But the question is, exactly what process should have been used here in this investigation, and was the investigation done appropriately, and how should these things be done in the future? And those are important questions. Um, and so, the the uh, um, and so the the there's a there's a judge who wrote this terrible decision that nobody has any reasonable expectation of privacy on the internet at all because the internet is really insecure and people get hacked into all the time. And so, if you're using the internet, um, you're pretty much owned, and so you might as well forget it. Uh, and that, that was his rationale for why it was okay for the FBI to do this, uh, because you know the internet is a cesspool of, of malware anyway. Um, and it's uh, you know I I, I I disagree with that point of view. Um, as a computer security person, it's frustrating because we try to make the internet less of a cesspool. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think it's I think it's a step too far. I think that you do have a reasonable expectation of privacy with respect to the stuff that's on your laptop. Um, uh, uh, you know, just as much as you do with respect to the contents of a phone booth. But um, so there, there are arguments about exactly what kinds of things construe a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and so, uh, how, how does encryption play into that? I think what's interesting is that encryption doesn't just convey a reasonable expectation of privacy. It conveys, if done properly, a, a total reality of privacy. Like it, it simply cannot be broken. And so, uh, um, you, you know, it's it's a little bit of a a, a different context. We don't necessarily require things to be encrypted in order to require a warrant in order to access them for what that's worth. Does that 
it was a bit rambling, but perhaps it's no, 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 things you were interested in. Great. No, I wanted to understand the, the juxtaposition of I'm, I get an ISIS, I get an ISIS um, newsletter, the yeah. employer, yeah. and it's put in my email, right. in my direct, in my uh, yeah, no, I, I mail box, you. right, or I get it over the web, right. and you know everybody can see it. Yeah. I'm kind of stupid so to we, expect people to not take action. Our policy yeah. today does not make that distinction, right? It does not distinguish between. I, I got this, I have an encrypted email and that's private, or I have clear text email and it's not private. We, do, we don't make that distinction. The policy today is the email going over the wire requires a warrant to access it regardless. Um, the, the, uh, but the, the, the distinction they do make is with respect to metadata. So, um, they, the, you know, in order to route that message, there's addressing information. And, you know, in the Postal Service, the postman has to read your envelope in order to route it. And so that information is exposed to somebody else. And so that information, they argue, is available without a warrant um, to the degree that you know, the NSA was pulling in everyone's telephone call information and storing it in a database. Um, and their argument was, again, um, it's just addressing information. It's exposed to the phone company. You don't have a right to privacy to it, and we can collect it all. Um, and so that's, that's really where that debate has gone. It's really about, so, so there's a debate about whether, um, you know, so fine the postman can read my individual addressing on my individual envelopes, but there's something different going on when you're collecting everybody's envelopes all the time and storing them in a database. Um, or is that, right? So that's, that's, the, well, that's where the, um, the, debate, the debate has gone. But that's, you make an interesting point. We, we don't, with respect to email, differentiate between um, email that's sealed and email that's not sealed for a Fourth Amendment standpoint today. Wrap it up. All right. Thanks to everybody. Hope this was interesting.